To me, osteopathy is about three things. Why this patient? Why this problem? And why now? Okay? A man is in the garden, he's working, he bends to pick up a rock, he gets acute back pain with sciatica. Okay? Why this man? Because he's obese, he doesn't exercise, he had an injury four years ago. Why this problem? because it's degenerative. And why now? Because he overloaded his system. Now that's a medical look at the problem because allopathic medicine is concerned with disease. Whereas osteopathic medicine is concerned with health. Still, any idiot can find disease. It takes a knowledgeable man to find health. And so the osteopath is going to look at the contribution of the whole body system into why that disc failed when it did. For example, it's a fact, it's imported in the journals, you can see the references, smokers get more back pain than non-smokers. Why? Because it's affecting the vascular system. And the vascular system is the supplier of life. Yeah? And so it's, it's this wonderful concept of looking at health, using a palpatory awareness, in diagnosis and in therapy mm -hmm. throughout the body and what you do is you achieve something you make a suffering patient okay easing them towards health all that medicine does is intervene to allow the body to heal itself and when this ability to heal itself begins to fail disasters occur just look at AIDS, clear example. The immune system is compromised. The body gets a, a small viral nasal infection. The guy dies of pneumonia because he hasn't got a protective mechanism. Whereas osteopathy allows me to work with muscle, ligament, bone, but also with the fluids, with the arterial, the venous and the lymphatic fluids to promote self-healing by looking at balancing forces. And this is why I find it today even today, as fascinating as it was when I first started. No, it's not that I don't do so. I don't think like that. Uh, the reason why is because those are techniques. Okay? So how you use the technique, when you use the technique, why you use the technique is what's important. So when I'm working with a patient, I will be using all of those tools. And I won't just call myself a cranial osteopath, only sitting there with my hands on the head. With cranial, it's, it's used um, sometimes to the exclusion of other facets of osteopathy. Whereas with one patient laying there, I might use a cranial technique, a visceral technique, a manipulation technique, all in the same 40 minutes. And the more tools I've got, then the more problems I can solve. No, I don't invent my own techniques. Uh, uh, well, the one, the one time when we did invent our own techniques yeah. was in pregnancy. Um, That's why, what I meant. Yeah, well, in pregnancy, you can't lay the patient face down. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you have to do things from a different yeah. way. You don't want any rotation onto the abdomen yeah. in pregnancy, so you use reverse techniques. We do a lot of the work sitting mm -hmm. in pregnancy because when she's laying on her back, it compresses the uh, vena cava, so you, you don't want her laying on her back for too long. So we had to look at all of the techniques and uh, that's why when I started working with pregnant women, it was a very sharp learning curve because I found immediately I couldn't do the very things that I'd been taught to do when I was a student. So um, I've developed a particular skill in obstetrics and uh, back in 1980, I founded the very, very first pregnancy clinic at the School of Osteopathy in London. Now every school as a pregnancy clinic, and I'm very proud of that. Um, 
Nice question. Um, I was a third year student, okay, young man. And I walked into the clinic at the school, into the room with the patient, and there was this lady standing in her underwear who was 34 weeks pregnant. Now, I'd never seen a pregnant lady in her underwear before, so this was the first shock. <laughs> okay, oh my God, <laughs> what's that? And uh, so I said to one of my teachers, can you show me what to do? And he said to me, do nothing. Don't touch, it's dangerous. I said, what? Oh, no, 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 no. no, no. I, I don't treat pregnancy, so it's finished. And I said, but what do we say to her? He said, say what you want to do, I'm not here. And so I had to go and find another teacher. It was a female teacher. And she said to me, oh, that guy's a dinosaur. Come, I'll show you. And she showed me how to work with a pregnant lady, how to even touch a pregnant lady. And when the patient came back a week later and she said, oh, thank you so much. I'm really feeling much more comfortable and most of the pain has gone. I thought, wow, this is exciting. And then I gradually started to treat more. And I said to the people at the reception desk, you know, if a patient phones in and she's pregnant, put it on my list. Uh, and I developed that speciality. Meanwhile, I was looking for some sort of scientific reference to support that guy's idea that it was somehow dangerous. I found nothing. Now I have a big computer in my house. It does automatic searching in journals. It looks at 20 international journals each month and it's certain keywords, it will pull the articles for me to read. There is still not one single published account of a manipulation causing an abortion. Yeah. Not one. You would expect one, yeah. two, nothing. Yeah. And that's why it's totally safe. Mm -hmm. The worst that can happen is that you won't be effective, mm -hmm. but you will never make them, make them dangerous to the baby or dangerous to the mother. And in pregnancy, you have this wonderful hormone called relaxing, which literally unwinds collagen. So it's actually easier to treat pregnant patients and to feel that change. Yeah. And for junior students to feel that change under their hands gives them such enormous confidence to go into the clinic and to treat other patients. So I find that it's great for the students, it's great for the practitioner who gets good results, it's great for the patient who achieves a degree of, of symptom relief. Now I work in London in the biggest private obstetric hospital in the UK. Okay? And all of the teaching professors from the medical schools have their private patients mm -hmm. in this place. Originally, I was brought there to see about pregnancy and back pain. That's what they think osteopathy is. Now, gradually, it's changing. Yeah. And the, 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 the professors will say to their patients, OK, now I want you to go and see Dr. Sandler and have treatment with him during your pregnancy because then my job will be easier. We, you will have a more natural birth, you will have an easier labor, and the baby will be much more content if you go to see the osteopath. And that's a wonderful thing. I remember one time I was uh, palpating the sacrum and using a craniosacral approach. So we have the patient laying on the side and I'm palpating and I'm thinking, that's a very strange feeling. And I could feel the sacrum moving, but there was something interfering with that movement. And I said to the woman, when are you next to you to go for your ultrasound or scan? Oh, she said, I went last week. I said, I see. And uh, did they discover anything interesting? Yeah, she said, yeah, the baby is laying with his spine against my spine. So I was palpating the baby's PRM because the baby's PRM is, exists and fluid is a wonderful transmitter of wave energy. And so the baby's PRM was bouncing off the mother's PRM and I'm picking up the mother's 
PRM, but at the same time, it's amazing. It's, it is amazing. I mean, um, it's uh, it's this 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 palpatory thing. Yeah. It's not a gift. Yeah. It's nothing esoteric. It's something you can, to exercise. You can train, yeah. and in all my years of teaching, I don't think I've failed yeah. with the student to get them to train. And I said this this morning in in my lecture. One of the things that's quite interesting is when you're working with students, especially when you're working with younger students. Um, They've only been in, they've been in training maybe for three years, and everybody learns at a different level. And what's the problem? Oh, I just can't feel it. You know, I'm trying to feel this motion. I can't feel it. Only by repeated manoeuvres and learning manoeuvres do you learn to become proficient at that. And that's a continuous process. That happens all through your life. There is no such thing as the ability to produce an abortion, mm -hmm. okay? Women fall down from the stairs, they fracture their pelvis, mm -hmm. they can be in a coma, and they keep them in a coma until the baby is born and then they die, okay? So there's nothing you can do. Yeah. If that baby is there and is in there, it's safe. But, there's always a but. How is the student going to feel? If the patient telephones and says, I'm not coming back to see you. After I saw you last time, I lost the baby. He's going to think it's him. Yeah. yeah, but it isn't. If you look in a calendar, there are certain times in every pregnancy where the likelihood of a spontaneous, natural miscarriage is going to occur. Mm -hmm. Week four, week 12, week 16. Sorry, 4, 8, 12, 16. Those are the four. Week four, she doesn't even know she's pregnant. Mm -hmm. So you can forget about that. Okay? But if you say to her, how many weeks pregnant are you today? And she says, I'm eight weeks today. I'm 12 weeks today. You say, fine, don't treat her. Mm -hmm. Come back next week and I'll treat you next week. Yeah. Because then if something happens, you're not around. Yeah. yeah. yeah? And that protection mechanism is what I, I give to my young students. Personally, I treat every patient all the way through the pregnancy. It doesn't bother me, but I'm the one with the experience. Mm. And so the youngsters are quite happy. Many people say don't treat in the first trimester. That's wrong. Sometimes that first trimester is exactly when they need the treatment. Yeah? Uh, but it's, it's such a safe way of working with the absolute minimum of force. You know, when I'm manipulating in the sacroiliac joint, you know, I'm just finding the minimum tension. And people look like, what did you do? You didn't do anything. Oh yes, you did, the pain's gone. <laughs> you know, and you don't have to use force. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to use force at all. Yeah. So to sum it up is to get rid of that fear for treating pregnant women yes. and um, to find the right time to do it as well? Yeah. Okay. And don't treat for too long. Very often, oh, I'm just going to do a little bit more. I'm just going to do a little bit more. No. Yeah. It says in the original, find it, fix it, leave it. 80%, 80% of pregnant patients will get back pain or, or some other mechanical pain. They can't take pills. They don't want to lay in bed. Stress on the baby. Some of the physio exercises, you can't do them when you're pregnant. But don't worry, you'll be okay when the baby's born. And they're not okay. They have postnatal problems. I find that with our patients, in pregnancy in particular, they get better quicker. They're more grateful. Okay, and then you go on to work them through the different changes that are taking place in the cardiovascular system, in the respiratory system, in the gastrointestinal system, in the urinary system, in the vascular system, and in the pelvis. Yeah. You know, and all those changes, which are going to happen anyway, you're going to encourage those changes. You know, it, it, it's, it's remarkable. This baby is growing up, okay, and all the viscera, all the organs are just being squeezed away. Your heart ends up 15 degrees off its axis. Your stomach ends up underneath your armpit on the left side. The liver is round here. 
because the baby just pushes everything out of the way. The uterus just, just expands. If you can treat them physically so as to encourage that change, and if you can treat them so that the change in physiology takes place equally easily, then they go through a decent and a nice enjoyable pregnancy. And that's the aim. Well, um, I've had three kids yeah. and uh, <laughs> I've advised them in many different ways. But the one thing I think that's very important for youngest people coming into our profession is believe what you feel, not feel what you believe. Don't arrive with a preconceived idea, okay? But when you put your hands on, have the courage to say, I can't understand what I'm feeling, but I can feel it. That's the first thing. The second thing is that um, this, this idea of believing what you feel and not having a preconceived idea is, is part of being aware that you will never have all the answers. Nobody has all the answers because nobody has all the questions. And you know, you, you always want to do more and a patient will come in sometimes and they're worse. And they, they may end up going to surgery or something. It happens. You know, nobody's perfect in this world, but believe in the power of palpation mm -hmm. and have the confidence to believe that I don't understand what I'm feeling, but I can feel it. Know that you're never going to get it 100% right. And don't ignore the fact that you're human too. So make sure that you choose the right technique for you. And there's many, many, many techniques out there. And then every day becomes a pleasure and you enjoy what you do. And like, this is not a rehearsal. You know, this is the real thing. And if you get halfway through the course in osteopathy and you decide you don't like it, fine, go and do something else. But what you will have learned as an osteopath will help you with other things. And I think that this is, this is a, a philosophy. It's a, it's a practical thing. It's a healing thing. It's not an art in itself. You, you learn it and you can, you can teach it. But at the end of the day, um, I'm really happy that I became an osteopath. Thank you so much, Steve. You're inspiring. Thank you.